We always have you on every year um, to talk about what you kind of have going on. One of the things and, and how I met you was through teaching fishing and, yep. and one of the schools that you guys put on. Um, tell folks that are watching uh, what teaching fishing is. So what teaching fishing is, um, it is an online educational, an online fishing educational platform. So we do courses, we have classes, we obviously have video stuff. Our whole focus is to help people catch more fish, right? So if you learn in short bursts or short videos, if you learn in 15 or 20 minute classes, if you learn better with three hour courses, uh, or you wanna do take some of our uh, definitive stuff that is 11, 12 hours worth of uh, content plus some time on the water. But we've structured everything towards education now. What we do is focused on teaching anglers how to catch more fish. And you know, we made that transition about 18 months ago and we're really starting to get some traction with, with the courses that we do. Um, the tough part is keeping up with creating enough content. That, that, that's the hard part is um, creating and creating multiple, uh, creating the same content multiple ways, right? Because like I said, somebody may learn best in a, a, a one minute video clip. Somebody may take five minutes. Some people like the classroom idea. So we gotta do the same uh, topic multiple different ways so everybody can learn the way they learn. But uh, I love it. My focus has always been on the education part of it. It's what I enjoy, and you know, being here, here, being here, we run into a lot of people out here in New York who've, who've seen our stuff. So it's really cool to kind of connect, uh, put a face with the name that we've seen on, you know, on some of our live stuff. We just had one here from Jeremy Maslowski. Just thanks again for hosting the show, Chris and Trevor, and now Lance uh, from a cool yet sunny Little Falls, Minnesota. <laughs> so uh, we escaped Minnesota to come out here. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, it's it's been it's been kind of an interesting mild winter with uh, not a lot of ice coverage and that's the talk here we've been talking to a lot of people here and what they're used to seeing in the Niagara River what they're used to seeing out on Lake Ontario very different the water's dirty because there's no ice on Lake Erie and it's it's just going to speed up the spawn it's just going to do some things now may it move it a, a forward a little bit probably right but people have to remember that that walleyes in our part of the world spawn from late February to early June every year Right, and there's a lot more to triggering spawn between today. It's moon phase. Lots of so, um, guys are catching fish. Uh, you know, the runs earlier for that whatever the case may be. It's really not. We're just we're just able to get to fish that we usually can't get to. They're in the same spot they always are. We usually can't get to them because of the ice. So you know, maybe push maybe push the front end of the spawn forward. It's not going to affect the length of it at all. Yeah. And that length of day thing is really, really Huge. interesting. And people don't realize it. I actually used to do work for a pheasant breeding operation. Yep. And what they would do is they'd have these dark barns and they would manipulate the light. Light, the, yep. The, the barn would be completely dark. They would manipulate the light to get those those uh, pheasants to you know, become fertile. So, and when, when Ali's on <clears throat> at 640, he's been doing some experiments with some juvenile walleye. And one of the things he does is they manipulate the to get them to actually react faster. Yep. Um, so yeah, people have to realize that, you know, what for me, again, pretty detailed record keeper, I can tell you the peak spawn on the Detroit River is April 10th, April 20th every year. I mean, that, that's somewhere in there is gonna be the best part of it, right? If you wanna get a little further, the 12th to the 17th is kind of the, the key of the key. So it doesn't matter on April 15th, if the water temperature's 40 degrees or 60 degrees, that's going to be the peak because that's when the daylight is the best. So uh, there's a lot more to it than just water temperature. You talk to somebody who, who hunts big bucks, right. they will tell you, they will talk about moon phase and they will talk about length of daylight till they run out of breath because that's a big deal. It's a big deal with walleye spawning too. Yeah, I use that for hunting all the time. It, it, it is, it's amazing. And, and just that bird farm thing is really where I learned yep. it. It was insane. Um, let's talk about we kind of got off topic in the teaching fishing thing once we started yeah, getting yeah. that. But, but let's talk about that. And one of the things that, that you teach there that I find just really, really interesting and something that I think um, a lot of people that they want to get into catching more fish is the eight steps. Yeah. Can, you, can you talk about that? Yeah. So uh, when I started doing this back, you know, 30 years ago now, um, I had to have a way to put all the information into a framework, right? That actually worked. So we came with the eight steps and, and really it's, it's, it's an expansion. Uh, I'll give credit where credit's due. It's an expansion of the old in fisherman F plus L plus P equals success, right? So our eight steps in order of importance are be in the right location, be in the right depth of water, know how deep the fish are so you know how deep to put your lures, get your lure speed right, lure size right, 
lure shape right, lure action right, and lure color right. So that's one through eight. The key to remember is number eight is not important until one through seven are right. That's the key thing. So we came up with this framework. So everything we teach, we relate back to where it fits in those eight steps. So we want, we want people to understand the process of fishing. You talk to any good angler, a couple things come, a couple things right away come to mind. They keep good records. They pay attention to what's going on before they go fishing. They're checking weather, waves, wind. They're checking all that two, three days before they go fishing, right? And they're always understanding what the fish are actually doing. Where are the bait fish and where are the fish going to relate to those bait fish that are happening right now? That's that first part. That's being in the right location, right at the water, finding fish on your sonar and getting your lures where the fish can see them. If you do those three things, you can do the presentation thing completely wrong and still get bit. But if you do the presentation, right speed, right size, right shape, right action, right color, if you do all that right and you're not in the right location, not in the right depth, and your lures and where fish can see it, you'll catch nothing. So the eight steps are important. Location, depth of water, depth of the fish, depth of your lure, then lure speed, size, shape, action, color, in that order. That's how we teach. That's how we want you to learn. And we want you to evaluate information on the water. When you catch a fish, you've answered all those eight questions. Catch a second fish, you've answered them again. Now you got to start asking yourself, what was the same? What was different? So you start to find these patterns. That's how you pattern fish. And that's why we came up with the eight steps was the ability to take information both on and off the water, plug it in somewhere where it fit, be able to analyze it and use it to catch more fish. Yeah, it's interesting that the, the order that you have it in, color was last. Yep. And it seems like every forum or Facebook group you go to, and the guys bragging about going out and catching a bunch of fish, everybody wants to know what color yep. it's using. And, and, and you rank that one last. Last. Now, not saying color's not important, I'm saying color is not important until, right? So you take take that lure that's catching all the fish, drive a mile and a half away where there's no fish, that lures are irrelevant. That color doesn't catch any fish, right? And guys know that, but they, for some reason they just don't put it together. Right? And the other thing too with color, I'm I'm not a huge colored guy. The big thing is you know custom colored crankbaits has become a, a great big deal, right? And I tell guys all the time, if you're fishing in open water, turn your baits over, look at the bottom. Because when you're five, six, seven feet above a fish, they don't see the top, right? The bottom of the lure catches fish, the top of the lure catches fishermen. So when you go to your store and you buy these $12, $14, 16 crankbaits, and you pull them out and they all got an orange belly, they're all the same. To a fish six feet below it, they are all, they don't care about the dots and the sparkles and the specks and the color on the top, could care less. It's the same. So when you, when you start to look at buying new crankbaits, turn everything you have over, look at the bellies and go, hey, I have no pink, I have no green. I have no chartreuse bellies. Start buying those. Start working on the bottom first. Stop worrying about all that other stuff. So, number one is location. Number one is location. That spot. And we can go back to that, that hunting analogy we were talking about earlier. Um, I've got a buddy who is just an absolute deadly public land hunter. And when you ask him, like, well, how do you, you know, what's the secret? And he'll go on these trips, and the first two days of his trip, he never hunts. All he does is look, you know, he looks, looks. Yeah, he gets to a spot where he can observe and he just sits and observes. And he almost always kills a deer in the first day or yep. two once he starts hunting because he has the whole thing figured out before he even walks in there. Um, how do people do that from a fishing standpoint? It's 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 all it's, all, it's it's two things. It's number one, it's charts, right? And today, you know, 2023, everybody's got these really cool digital charts, and that's okay, but man, you cannot beat a paper chart. The ability to look at pieces of big structure look at structure as it relates to the whole lake right even on a 16 inch screen you don't see a lot with a digital map so you've got to have good charts understand walleyes look at walleyes do the same exact thing deer do there's places they live there's places they may move to feed and they definitely travel and they travel along edges right so you find a place where the bait fish should be that time of year that's where the walleyes are going to feed where can they go and be comfortable and be a little bit out of the current the wind whatever the situation is and what the travel, what's the highway to that? That's where they're gonna be. So a good chart shows you those basic ideas. Then you go to your sonar, you go to those places, you start driving around, you look for the fish, you determine where they at, you determine how deep they are. So now you know where to put your bait. So it's it's look first on a map, which I'm sure your buddy does. I'm sure your buddy studies you know, quad charts and he kind of knows where the ridges are and where the valleys are. Same thing with, with walleye fishing. And then instead of going out and be able to look at the physical signs like you can when you hunt, now it becomes sonar. You're using your sonar to look down below the water what is actually happening. So you mentioned earlier, you know, you do a lot of fishing in the Detroit River, especially early in the year. 
how does finding those fish in that river, how is that different than finding the fish that's out of the basin? Great question. So as fish get closer to the bottom, which they do in current, the heavier the current is closer to the bottom, they get harder to pick out. So my big focus on the Detroit River is side scan. So before I'll, I'll go up to a spot that I think should be a good area, right? And before I'll fish it, I will drive and I'll look on the side scan. And I'll drive right next to guys fishing. And I'll say, you know, I'm watching, there's no nets, there's no nets. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Ah, we've been here for half an hour, I haven't got anything. I'm like, well, well, yeah, I'm looking underneath your boat. Well, there's no fish here. Why are you still fishing here, right? So I use my side scan as opposed to regular sonar because I can pick those fish out. And with the side scan, once you find a pot of fish, you simply move your cursor over, you save a waypoint at the cursor, you go upstream with that cursor, you drift back down, you catch 90% of the time you catch those fish. Now here's the cool thing. You see four fish in a pod, you make two passes, you catch four, you don't go back and make a third pass. You pick up, you put your rods in the rod holder and you start driving again looking for another pod because there were four there, you caught four, there's no sense being there. Look at, I don't care how good of a fisherman you are. I don't care how invisible your fishing line is. I don't care how super duper your lure is. You can't catch fish unless you're fishing where the fish are. Right. And that's the biggest thing to get. Too many guys want to put lures in the water before they know there's a fish there. So go back to hunting. I equated, I teach it this way when we teach a sonar class. Go uh, opening day of deer season, right? I got a friend that's got a farm up north, 400 acres, completely mowed flat, just 400 acres of mud. Go there the first day of deer season, stand in the middle of that 400 acres, put a blindfold on, put a shell on your gun, spin around the circle. At some point, shoot, bang. Did you expect to shoot a deer? That's the dumbest thing. That's how guys fish. They drive around the middle of the lake, put some random crap behind the boat, and they say, come on fish, right? So trying to get people to understand that you have to find fish first to know they're there. And then, you know, look at it again, Chris, when you find them on your sonar, how they're located tells you their activity level, how fast you could be able to fish, what kind of presentation you need to use. So finding a little bit of stuff on your sonar gives you all of these details that help you put the presentation together that you can't do until you see that picture. All right, you've got the location, you, you find the fish using your side scan or using your charts. How do you go about kind of dialing in that, that presentation? So presentation for me, um, down a river, we're gonna talk open water right now. Let's, let's talk river first, okay. and I wanna ask about a lake. Uh, so what's what I think is really important um, for me, I like to determine, I, I do two things when I'm jig fishing, and, and where we fish is all vertical jigging, right? Two things are really important to me. How fast my jig falls back to the bottom and what angle it falls back. And I adjust that by what size plastic I use. And I will tell you with, again, without any hesitation at all, if you get the right shaped plastic in the wrong color, you'll catch a lot more fish than you will the wrong shaped plastic in the right color. So each piece of plastic, and I carry five different ones from a, a three inch real thin worm all the way up to a five inch paddle tail. Each one of those has different bulk. They fall different. They're slower, faster to fall, and they fall back to the fish or straight down. That's what I'm trying to figure out. So everybody in the boat, I got usually four customers and myself and a charter, everybody in the boat's got something different. And once we dial in on the shape and the jigging motion, then I start working on the color, right? I may change jig color, I may change body color, whatever the case may be. But the first thing for me is I wanna get the right shape, imitate the bait fish that the walleyes are feeding on, get the right fall rate and the right fall uh, angle then I can start worrying about color. All right, how about that same process in it more of a trolling? Thing? So in trolling, it's the same thing, right? I get as many rods as I can above the fish. Now, one thing that I do uh, that is different than 99% of the people I talk to, I don't stagger lures. So let's say I see fish at uh, 15 feet. I'll put one side of my boat at, let's say, 13. Other side of the boat, every lure is at 11. So now I don't have to worry that I miss the fish inside my spread because if it, a traditional guy would go, uh, maybe uh, 8 feet, 10 feet, 12 feet down on his lures, outside to inside, right? Problem is that that lure that, that's going to hit an 8-foot lure, if he's not behind that board, you're not going to catch him. If the fish that's, that's go, if the board goes over a fish that's 8 feet deep and the lure is 15, you're not going to catch him. So I, I eliminate all of that. I eliminate that, that distance from my boat. So one starboard side is all one depth. Port side's a completely different depth. I don't catch any fish, I come back, I change those two depths. Then what happens, almost always, is a, for one or two passes, I catch them. Then once I get that down in, everything goes to the same depth. And I just make this great big giant pass, and as soon as the fish stop biting, we go back and we start all over again. Too many anglers don't like to accept no for an answer. They think that by spreading their stuff out, 
but you eight times more productive. I had a guy on my boat that was that's a statistician for Ford one day, and we were fishing on the pontoon. And we I, I run 16 rods on the pontoons, so it's pretty easy to you know scour water. Yeah. But I asked him about it. I says, okay, three rods is a normal spread, three rods on each side. I says, if I put a bait here, here, and here, or I put all three baits at the same, what are my chances? And he sat down in front of the pontoon about five minutes later. He goes, I says, I'm telling you, it's eight times you got eight times better chance of catching a fish. Here's how he described it. Take a piece of watermelon and put three seeds in it at different for different distances from the rind and different depths in the in the in the meat, right? You have to to catch that seed, you have to take a knife slice. That's all of the thickness you have, and it has to be perfectly on top of that fish and stop at the right distance. So if your knife slice is too deep or too high, you're not gonna catch those fish. He says, What you're doing, everything's the same. You're taking a sheet of paper and running it through. That meat now, any fish that's below that sheet of paper, no matter where they are, has a chance to see your bait. So I would tell guys, when you start trolling, one depth, one depth. If that doesn't work, come back, reset, do it again. Once you get dialed in, then now you can now you can dial in different lures, different shapes, different actions, different colors. Now you can really dial in because you know where the fish are at. Yeah, that, that watermelon. That's it. That's, that's a good analogy, yeah, isn't it? Good, yeah, you know, yeah. It's a very it's a good way to picture <laughs> it. The other thing you brought up there is your pontoon. And I think when people think of fishing <laughs> lake erie they would say why why would you ever do that in a pontoon <laughs> that sounds insane uh tell us about your your fishing pontoon. so i fish uh, i fish a, an anger quest pro troll uh 24 foot with a two foot deck extension so 26 foot deck designed from scratch to be a fishing boat so it's a it's a hardcore fishing boat on a pontoon platform 25 inch uh, tubes triple tune 200 horsepower motor uh i can run 16, 18, 20 rods on it with no problem. Lots of room. And here's the thing that guys don't understand about pontoons. Pontoons handle rough water, rough water better than any other boat on the market does. Because I'm riding on top of the water, I'm not digging through it, right? Um, they don't rock side to side. You get a single, you get a regular boat with a single keel, you're gonna move this way. Pontoons don't do that because they can only go so far. Lots of room, very, very safe, very, very comfortable. Lots of room to put people, lots of room to put rods on. And this boat, again, was designed as a fishing boat. If you get a chance to fish on one, get on one, because they are they are absolutely amazing platforms for fishing. So we're going to say tell one more hunting story. <laughs> and about 10 years ago, I bought an old minivan as my hunting vehicle. And everybody makes fun of minivans, but it is an awesome hunting yep. machine. The slide doors, you got the big area Lots of room. Back, a lot of yep. room. So same thing. Pontoon is one of those things that people are like, you're going to do that? And then you're like, yeah, it, it's really nice. You can't, you can't just, you know, you can't take a regular 18 foot pontoon with, you know, 18 inch tubes and do it. But there are pontoons now built specifically for fishing, and, and that's what Anger Quest does, and that, that's what they build. So, um, if you're sitting here going, there, you guys crazy, right. uh, open another tab, go to AngerQuest.com, and and look at the, look at the Pro Troll series specifically. It's designed for, it's a hardcore fishing boat built on a pontoon platform, is what it is.